Jesus, if you would meet me once again, Psalm 23 and verse 3, and we just want to do the A part. If you have the King James Version, you'll find these holy, divine, and inspired words. He restoreth my soul, the word of God. He restoreth my soul. Philip Keller, in his wonderful book entitled, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, he gives us great insight into the life of a shepherd. Blessed by his multiple careers, he was able to bring light uh, on his experiences by actually raising sheep. In his books, he writes about what the British call, Eric, they, they call a cast sheep or a cast down sheep, one that gets itself literally as Diana Ross would say, turned upside down. Sometimes a sheep, Sheena, a heavy sheep or an overweight sheep will decide to lie down in a hollow or a depression, which is a type of a valley, in the field. And depending there, but on the incline of the ground, the sheep can easily shift a little too far and get into a position where its feet no longer touch the ground. So now, Reverend Jackson, it's weighted down by its wool. The creature now will struggle, and then as the sheep struggles, what the sheep doesn't know is that the sheep is usually exacerbating the situation. And is it any wonder, again, why God calls us sheep? Because every time we try to help ourselves, we make the situation worse, and I don't know why we don't realize if my stinking thinking got me in here, how in the world is my thinking going to get me out of here? I need to relinquish this. I need to surrender, and I need to turn this situation over to someone who's brighter than I am. I need to turn this over to someone who's got more resources than I do. I need to turn this over to somebody that's omnipotent, that's omnipresent, that knows everything. It's apparently that I ain't got no sense. A cast sheep is a sad being. Legs usually just futilely flaying in the air. Gases building up in the room. Blood circulation draining away from the extremities. So now in this situation, Sister Barbara, now the sheep, which doesn't know, is actually more vulnerable to attack. Unable now to accept food or water. Sometimes mired in mud and briars, cast sheep can perish now in a matter of hours unless a shepherd takes them and then restores them. David said here, he restores my soul. There's an old shepherd, Maximum Sister Severnia, that says a down sheep is a dead sheep. The Bible sometimes speaks of people as being cast down. We tumble into the trenches of life and we need the shepherd's power. We need his strength. We need his strong shoulders. We need him to, to reach around us, reposition us. Sister Ruth, we need help. We need him to lift us, restore us, and to rehabilitate us. Why? Because at some point, we get cast down. Watch what the scripture says. Focus your eyes toward the screen. Look at Psalm 42 and 5. The psalmist says, Patty, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And sometimes what the psalmist does, if you read that, 
we need to take Robbie a clue from that because the psalmist is usually talking to himself or talking to his soul. And we're so sedity and so uppity and so intelligent that we, we don't like to talk to ourselves or the soul that's within us. But, but I'll tell you what, when you get hit with something that you can't handle, when, when something comes to you that your little education can't take care of and your money can't take care of, I guarantee you're going to start talking to somebody. So you need to at least start talking to your soul. Look what he said. Why aren't you casting? down oh my soul and why art thou disquieted in me then he's talking to a soul he said hope thou in God for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance and as David said earlier sometime brothers and sisters you waiting for the pastor you waiting for the preacher you waiting for your mom and your daddy your husband sometime you got to pat yourself on your own back and say go ahead brother you can make it because if you're waiting for us sometime all we gonna do is down you and dog you you need to start talking to yourself like shucks I think I can make this thing shucks I think I got this he He's talking to his soul and said, yet, I'm going to praise him for the help of his countenance. Uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, 6. Again, just keep your eyes toward the screen. He says, nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are cast down, he comforts us by the coming of Titus, son of Nicole and Minister Perry. Titus didn't know he would bring the church comfort when he came in. My question is now, are you cast down? You and you and you and you and, and you. Is your world turned upside down? Are you unable to right yourself? Just when you discover the answer, does the world change the question on you? When you get this board down at home, Bonner, does the board over there pop up? You ever get one kid straight and then the other one start acting a fool? It's just always something, always something. You want to lay down and rest. Okay, I put this to bed. Now here comes something else. You didn't killed Rodan. Now here come Godzilla. Anybody? I'm dating myself. A young kid, Rodan, Godzilla. We so frequently need these tiny four words, he restores my soul, the one that's cast down, the one that's disquieted in me. He restores that. Down there, the Hebrew verb means to restore vitality, vigor, and strength. In other words, he reinvigorates me, Dr. Matthews. He revives my strength. He brings my soul back to the former place that it was. That's what we mean by restore. You, you take an old car, beat up car somewhere and, and get it painted, get it waxed and all that, and you get that thing restored, and it looks like, or at least they try to make it look like it did in its former pristine state, and that's what God does with us. He said, I'm going to bring you back to the place where you used to look like what you used to look like. Thank God that he restored. He restores. He gives us power in life's trenches. And if you don't think you want to be restored, all you got to do is look in your own photo album at home. And I guarantee every one of us would want to be restored because we want that shape we used to have when we was 18. Can I get a piece of witness? What we're saying is, God, restore me back to when I could fit in that and breathe. What does God restore us from? Three things, three things, and we're going to let you go because I know y'all want to see the lions, Craig. We're going to let you go. S -s -s Football has started. You can't preach past one in the black church. <laughs> All right, Rev, you and God, that's y'all about, about up. The first thing he does is he restores us from sin. Sin, harmatia, it's a Greek word. It's a marksman word. It means to miss the mark. He restores us from sin. Now, here's the thing. We sheep, though, become cast down for many reasons, but the, 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 the reasons at the top 
is often the guilt and consequences of our own sin. It ain't what you said about me. It's what I did. And that's what casts us down. And that's what Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 is about. You can read that when you go home. But, uh, David, when he got uh, uh, busted with Bathsheba, that's where Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 was birthed. So you can read that at, at, at home. But, but let's look at Micah chapter 7, verse 19. Because the verse says, he will turn again and he will have compassion on us. And then it said, he will subdue our iniquities. And then it said, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the seas. Courtney, he cast all of them away. And the word all, catch me now, the word all has no limitation in extent or duration. He cast, it's right there, all their sins into the depths of the sea. He cast them into the sea, and it's the Red Sea of the crimson blood of Jesus shed for us at Calvary. And it's in the deepest regions, in the bottomless realms, never to resurface, never to be seen again. So the next time some sanctified church-toting, Bible-quoting person come to you talking about what you've done, say, you must not have read Micah 719 because God said he cast my sins into the sea and he put up a no fishing sign. Anybody want to bring up what you used to do? Well, shucks, everybody done done something. But I don't care what you think. I care what he said. See, when Satan wants to flog you, with memories of your sins, even if you can't sing a note, you need to muster up much note as you can and say, Satan, you must not have heard the hymnologist said, there is a fountain filled with blood that's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood and lose all their guilt and stains. And see what happens, God wants us to visually and vividly, and I'm going to show you with the scriptures, God wants us to imagine visually and vividly the total extent of forgiveness. And that's why these certain scriptures are in the Bible, because God wants you to conceptualize just what he done with your and my sins instead of letting everybody remind us that I used to do this. Isaiah. First of all, Job chapter uh, 14, verse 17. See, these scriptures are here, Reverend Jackson, because God wants us, again, to imagine vividly and visually the total extent of what forgiveness is, and we keep letting lesser folk who are doing more sinning than us remind us of our sin. That's like a crackhead talking about an alcoholic. Listen. He said, my transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up my iniquity. That word in the bag, that, that word, it, it literally, the sealed and the sowing, it literally means he plasters over. And y'all know what plaster does. If you, you grew up in the black house, you know what plaster, we'll put plaster over, yeah, we'll plaster it and hang up something over it. What the plaster does, it covers over. So the verse just said, it's mighty funny how you see in the stuff that God has covered over. How is it that you can see my sin and God with his all-seeing eye can't see my sin, but you can see it. And you don't even have 20-20 vision. So Rhonda, what he's saying there is he literally covers my sins over. That's what that verse says. Is saying so God has given us these scriptures so he said I want you to visualize and vividly see the total extent of your forgiveness what this restoration is Psalm 103 and 12 he says brother Randa as far as the east is from the west so far he hath removed our transgressions from us now I've said this before you don't believe me try it you can go north and you can go to a point where it'll turn in the south. You can go east and you never touch west. They never meet. 
And I know some smart folk out there that get in your car and try it. And then talk to me. But you better have a lot of gas and a lot of money because they don't intersect. So what God is saying, Henry, that since the east and west never meets, God says once he forgives you for that sin, he'll never meet it again. So those folk who keep driving up our sins must be going north and south. I'm going with God. I'm going east because the east and the west never meet. This should help somebody. Isaiah 1 and 18. See, you need to understand this. Quit letting lesser folk put you in prison. 18, sweetheart. Put a one in front of that eight. Isaiah 1, 18. Just add 10. Because I want verse, verse 18. And you need to see this. Isaiah 1, 18. And again, God wants us to vividly see Visually see the extent of his total forgiveness. Watch this. See, God says, come now and let us reason together. Now, when it said, come now and let us reason, God didn't say that he's going to change his mind about what we did. He said, come, let's reason together. Let's talk about what you've done. And once you confess and talk about what you've done, I got a way to clean you up. Watch this. He said, come, let us reason together, said the Lord. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, they be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. Now, Dr. Matthews, he, he mentions, again, scarlet and red like crimson for a reason. Because scarlet and red like crimson, it pictures the blood guiltiness where we stand guilty before God. Also, uh, Sandy, crimson uh, also means worm. Worm, referring to the color fast red dye of the scarlet worm. And Robbie, the eradication of this stain is caused by the blood of Jesus. He says, the, and y'all know what red does to stuff. If you wipe red, it get pink. Right, so it's best to leave it alone. So he says, though they be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They, they be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. It's the eradication of the blood of Jesus that makes that red stuff white. You remember LaShawn Pace Road sang a song and said, I, 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 I used to wonder how a brown cow eats green grass and gives you white milk. She said, well, if you think that's something in God's chemical laboratory of redemption, God took my black sin, dipped it in his red blood, and it came out white as snow. That's what God has done for you. That's what God has done for me. Isaiah 38, 17. He said, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. God Almighty, watch this, Craig. He said, for thou hast cast all my sins behind your back. And if you know one thing about God, you never see him returning. You never see him going back. He's always going forward. Say, so, well, what that mean? Well, since God never goes backwards, he'll never bump into my sin because God is only going forward. So the next time somebody comes and starts looking around your back, say, get in front of me because that's where I'm going. God has cast my sins and your sins behind his back, and they'll never come walk with you again. Isaiah 44 and 22. God said, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. He said, return unto me, or I have redeemed you. In other words, I have purchased you. I have bought you back. He's blotted them out. So, Andy, if God has blotted out your sins, why do I care about what you think about my sin? Colossians 2.14. <coughs> Colossians 2.14. It should free somebody. God done freed us. We just like Juneteenth. Some of us Christians don't know we've been freed. Robert, he says, blotten out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, was, y'all know what was is, 
if you've been in English two days, that's past tense, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, let me help you. The handwriting that Paul is talking about is a certificate of debt with its decrees. It's actually Delbert and IOU. And the scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. So since we've earned death by our wages, then that meant that we owe God. Jesus came along, went to Calvary, paid the debt, cleared the IOU, and now we don't owe God because we couldn't pay God. So Jesus came down since we couldn't go up, and he took care of the payment, and now the balance is clear because of his precious blood. And we got to pump some of us still to clap our hands. When the psalmist said, Reverend Orange, he restores my soul, he meant he restores me. He restores my emotional and spiritual well-being. He, he restores my spirit. He restores my sense of confidence and fullness in life. He restores the joy of my fellowship with God. Now, note that word restore, Darnell, is in the present tense. It's something that God does now immediately. What am I saying? Right now, as you're sitting there, he's restoring you. Right now, as you're sitting there, God is restoring you. So thank God he restores from sin. Secondly, he restores from stress. He restores, now we the line as folk. Because we got these little cliches. How you doing? Oh, child, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Oh, okay. Now, now let me get a real answer. How are you? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm blessed and highly favored. Oh, Lord. Go home. It's a garbage can full of hair by your bedside because you can't sleep and you're pulling out the three and four strands you got. Biting your fingernails like you LeBron James and you too blessed to be stressed. Got a stack of bills on your table. It looks like the post office. And you too blessed to be stressed. Car won't start, can't find the key, and the tire just left, and you too blessed. <laughs> he restores us from stress, y'all. The Lord also restores our soul when we have been under protracted stress. And if you got a family member living, it's somewhere in there. And if some of them left, you got stressed because now you got to pay for that one who left you with nothing. Folk in the casket moving. I'm wondering how my family going to pay for this. Go on, die. You're already dead. Just lay down. They'll figure it out. Like sin, stress can leave us cast down. It can it can leave us, it zaps our attitudes and energy during times of stress. And God restores us with his almighty presence and his animating promises. We never get this, you got, we never face a situation that's not covered by the promises contained in God's word. I don't care what pops up in your life, baby, there's an answer in here for you. There's a solution in here for you. There's a way out for you, and his name is Jesus. I can't figure him out. That ain't my job. My job is to trust him, obey him, and walk in obedience. If God tells me to jump through that wall, it's my responsibility to jump, and he is to get me through it. God will get you through, baby. He restores us from stress. Stress can make you look 60 when you're 16. It's some folk, Nicole, it's some folk, I, ooh, heaven, oh, it's some folk that ain't 30 and they look like they've been drove hard and put away wet. Oh, stress will do it. Oh, baby, like, oh, no, they're putting on lotion like, oh, no, no, you need mink oil. You, that, uh-uh. No, Crisco, you need like 
on top of the stove grease. Yeah, you, you, oh man, stress, stress will, oh, stress will, stress will take you from being, ooh. And God restores us from stress. Lastly, lastly, he restores us from sorrow. If he ain't never had it, that's fine. But keep living. Yeah, keep on living. He restores us from sorrow. And all you got to do is watch the news. It don't have to be you. The little boy in Kalamazoo yesterday, five years old, got hit on the thing. It doesn't have to be your child for you to experience sorrow. And it shouldn't just have to be your child. You should, we should have a heart that yearns for every child. You saw the nonsense. The kids at school, uh, the boy, uh, the teenager, he's going, Craig, from the polar bear. And some kids ask him for some money. He ain't got none. They start beating him on the Facebook. And, and oh, man, if I had a taser, every one of them little son of whoever. That stuff just brings you sorrow. You don't have to know them. You, then somebody always filming it. And then, you know, they're going to press charges. And the mama go, he's only 15. Well, he was acting like he was 30. And we need to put him and you in there. Because they wouldn't be doing this if something was right in here. They get mad when a police beat up side us up the side of the head. But as long as there's 10 blacks beating the black, nobody cares. But let somebody white do it. Oh, that's wrong. What's well, wrong for them to do it? Brother. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. The Ku Klux Klan can just quit because we're doing a good job. They can just go to take a, a vacation somewhere because we seem to be good at getting rid of one another. He restores us from sorrow. Look at Job 41, 22. And there's a whole lot of stuff causes you sorrow. All you got to do is just look at the news and some of you are going to watch the Lions game today, and you're going to need this verse. Watch this. I ain't safe for either team. I just say, you know, you know, Megatron gone. They ain't got nobody to throw to. In his neck remaineth strength. And look at this. Sorrow is turned into joy before him. And what I love about God, JQ, see, God don't do like us. God is not a substitute. He didn't say he'd substitute it. He said he would turn it into. Did you see that? We like to substitute stuff. And if you start substituting stuff for your child, you're going to have a spoiled child. Your child, he wants somebody to come over. So now you call his friend to come over. So now everything that the child wants, you don't transform the situation, you substitute it. And when you can't substitute no more, now the child like, wait a minute, where my pony show? Because you've never transformed the situation. What God says, I'm not going to give you nothing new. I'm going to take the same stuff that you're in that you don't like, and I'm going to turn it around so it works in your favor. I'm going to turn that sorrow into joy. And he gives us a perfect example in the scriptures. He said, it's a woman when she's in travail. The woman, the baby, the big head, fat, big head baby. He, he, he's hurting the mama because his head big. But he just have it. The baby fat ain't even came out yet. And it's hurting the mama. And she's in travail and she's pushing and she's pushing and half crazy anyway and pushing and all this stuff going on and grabbing everybody and talking about everybody and ah, Jesus and calling Jesus and the devil and everybody else at the same time. All of a sudden when it pop. When the kid comes out, they stop. And when the nurse hands them that baby or that vehicle, depending on what she gave birth to, they stop. And they do like this. And you say, Reverend, where are you going? What I'm saying, the same thing that caused the mama pain is now the same thing that's causing the mama to joy. And that's what God does with us. Y'all know them. You y'all know all that hollering and snotting and as soon as you get the baby. Now, how's something beautiful covered in red? Oh, yeah, ain't it cute? And then black folk go to lie and look just like his daddy. He looks like a baby. We trying to figure out who he going to look like. Now, mama, wait, is his ears going to darken? Let the baby come out. <laughs> figure out who the daddy is. Let the baby breathe a couple hours. Don't you think it looked like, no, it looked like a slimy, nasty baby. 
I know because they gave me two of them. Put them right in my hand. No, no, God, y'all, let, he will turn your sorrow into joy. He's not a substituter. He'll transform the situation so that you don't be dependent upon substitutes. Lamentations 3, 21 and 24. And I'm about to take my seat or stand up or do something. He says, this I call to mind, to my mind. See, that, you got to talk to yourself, Bonner. Don't worry about folk thinking you're crazy. They already do. He said, this I recall to my mind. You got to talk to yourself. He said, therefore, I have hope. See, you may think I'm crazy, but talking to myself, Alicia, gives me hope. He said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Why? Because his compassions fail not. Watch this. Watch this. Y'all going to like this. He said, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What, what, what? Every morning. Watch this. He said, the Lord is my portion, said my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. I love this about God. God don't microwave you up a blessing. God sends you a new one every morning. Today is Sunday. He woke you up with Sunday mercy. He didn't give you Saturday mercy. He woke you up with Sunday morning mercy and I thank God for a right now mercy I thank God for a merciful savior that went to a hill called Calvary a place they called the skull thank you Jesus for dying for me thank you for rising from the dead thank you for coming in my heart thank you for restoring me for revigorating me thank you for making me look new see the smooth skin again that's what God does to you See, down there, all I had to do was go in the bathroom and cut the hair off. And, and it's, it's still some stuff ain't going away, but, but I can get rid of something. <laughs> but God does better than get hair from your face. He restores you. He gives you that new look again. He puts a shine on you. He puts a wax on you. Huh? Why? Because the psalmist said, he restores my soul. I don't care what you think. I don't care how you feel. I know that God has restored me. I know that my sins are hid in the blood of the Lamb. I know that my sins are behind his back. I know that my sins are in the sea of forgetfulness. I know that God has eradicated my stain. And I can take rest in the fact that he's restored me from sin. He restored me from stress. And he restores me from sorrow. The door of God's church is open. The door of God's church. The door of God's church is open. If you're here today and you've never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what we just preached about and read, just as we talked about in Sunday school with those words, thy kingdom come, if you haven't met Jesus, you cannot say, he restores my soul. In order for you to be able to say, he restores my soul, then that must mean that he's your shepherd. See, a goat can't say he restores my soul. Only a sheep can say that. So you have to be a sheep of Jesus who's the good shepherd. We talked about this morning in Sunday school. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. He says, no man comes to the Father, Reverend Jackson, unless he comes by me. You have to be adopted into the family or born into the family through the process that we call being born again or through the conversion experience. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can this be? How can a man, can a man when he's old be born again? I don't understand that. Jesus said, you must be born of water and blood. When they pierced Jesus on the cross, mama, the Bible said blood and water came out. Blood for my redemption, water for my baptism. You must be born 
into the family. And the way you're born into the family, you must individually accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You can't say, well, my mother is saved or my father is saved or my husband is saved. So therefore, God takes this total passage. You remember when John the Baptist, when the Pharisees, the church folk came to see him, he said, what, 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 who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And they start saying, we are children of Abraham. They thought just because they were connected uh, to the lineage of Abraham that they had a right to heaven. And John the Baptist said, God can take one of these stones and make it the children of Abraham. He said, no, no, you must have fruits worthy of repentance. You don't get into heaven. We don't get into heaven because we're good. We get into heaven because God is good. We don't have to work to get there. What we need to do is accept the finished work he's already done. You can't work your way into heaven. But you can get there for free. Because the scripture says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. It's a free gift. And we don't have to be soiled and stained anymore because his precious blood cleans us and makes us white as snow that's why in the book of revelation when they saw him john said i saw him on a white horse his name is truth and john said he had a name and a vesture and a name on his thigh that no one understood he said and those that followed him were in robes of white you know that were white because they had been cleansed by the blood of the lamb and these were soldiers in white robes robbing we're the only soldiers Christians in the world that don't have to fight. The fight is over. All we do is show up and collect the spoils because Jesus did the fighting. That's why he's called the Lord of hosts. He is going forth to conquer and conquer. But you can't say he restores my souls if your soul ain't been redeemed. You need to be bought back Colossians said he has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You can't get by Jesus, y'all. Jesus, I said it before, he's like Midas. He said, pay me now. I'll pay me later. But you ain't getting around me. And grandmama and them used to say when we was young, Jones, they said, he too big to go over. They say he too low to go under and he too wide to go around. You're going to have to meet him one day. And I'd rather you meet him as the Lamb of God. I don't want you to meet the lion from the tribe of Judah. I'll take my chances with a lamb. Right now, he's defense attorney, but he's coming back as prosecuting attorney. And if you're not covered in the blood, that's the only way you will be made free. Will there be one today that wants to give your life to Christ? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, curious ruler, the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth your confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart man believes unto righteousness. It don't take all day. The folk done lied to us. You ain't got to run. You ain't got to skip. You ain't got to flip. You ain't got to get saved Monday, get the Holy Ghost Tuesday, jump through a roof on Wednesday. That's all man-made malarkey. The scripture said, Jesus said, in the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Behold, today is the day of salvation. The minute we crawl out to him, that minute he takes us by the hand. And he accepts us into the family of God. Salvation is not a long, drawn-out process. The minute you receive Jesus into your heart, that's when he comes in. And he don't come in to visit. He comes in. He says, I'll abide with you. And, and he comes to take over. And that's the greatest thing we could do is surrender our lives to him. We've made a mess of our own on our own. And he's the one that puts us in line, gives us direction, gives us purpose, gives us mission, gives us vision, 
And now we can feel fulfilled lives. Don't mean that you won't have problems now. Don't let nobody fool you. Talking about join church, all your problems will leave. Join one and find out. You're going to create some new ones. Because some of God best hired head folk in church. I'm just telling you the truth. But it's still the best place in the world to be. Because remember, Jasmine, the church is styled as the old ship of Zion. Referring to the ark. Now, everything was on that ark. It was some stuff on that ark didn't get along. It was some cats and dogs. It was some gnats and mosquitoes. It was some horses and mules. It was some stuff that didn't get along. It was some people that didn't get along. But watch this. Everything on it survived. It was some stuff on the ark that didn't smell right because there was animals on the ark, y'all, and there wasn't no toilet tree. And them animals and people, both Jones, had to use the bathroom. It was on our ark a long time, brother. You can't hold it that long. So in other words, Sister Henry, there was some stuff on the ark that didn't smell right. It's some stuff in church that don't smell right. But everything on the ark survived. Everything that wasn't on it died. Deacon Richard, here's the kicker. They didn't get on the ark because of the accommodations. They got on because of the captain. And the captain of this ship name is Jesus. And that's why you need to get on. Because I, 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 I know all the lies. I've been in, I know churchology. I, I know churchology. I know we say, well, I ain't going to go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. You just left Walmart and they full of them. You go to work every day around a thousand of them. And now all of a sudden you don't want to be around them. Well, you got to go home to your husband and wife. One of them a hypocrite. So let's stop lying and face the truth because Jesus said the truth shall set you free. I tell people all the time, well, I don't want to go to church because you know, I don't want to be around, uh, you know, hypocrites. I'd rather go to church and be around a few of them than go to hell and be with all of them. Simple to me. And actually, there are no hypocrites in the church. Now, you will find hypocrites in the church building. You will find hypocrites in the seats. You ain't going to find none in the church. I'm talking about the body of Christ. You can fake it till you make it if you want to. God said, leave it alone. Let the wheat and the tech grow together. You don't know a real root from a perm. You leave stuff alone. I'll do the separating. Is that right? No, no, I'm messing with you. Will there be another that will give you life? To? It's the best place to be. It's the only thing Jesus coming back for. And if you ain't on the ship, Caleb Phil said, ain't going to be rain this time. Fire. And it ain't like joy. It ain't going to be shut up in your bones. It's going to be on your bones. And you're going to burn every day forever. It's for so long it took to fall off. You're just going to burn ever. But you don't have to do that. Because Jesus said you don't have to go there. I died for you so we don't have to be separated. And all we have to do is receive him into our heart. Will there be another that would give Christ your life? Not me. Give it to Jesus. Candidates for baptism, that simply means if you never confess Christ, you need to confess him. Give me your hand, but more importantly, God, your heart for heaven, you can make a start. I don't have a heaven for you, I don't have a hell for you. But I can show, introduce you to my shepherd. And he'll save you. And remember, when he saves you, he throws your sins out behind his back. He puts them in the sea of forgetfulness, and then he puts up a no fishing sign. He seals them in the bag. He covers them with plaster. And when God looks on us, he only sees the clean robe of righteousness that Jesus has covered us with. Thank God that he restores us to that 18, 16-year-old figure spiritually. Praise God.
I don't care if you've been on this, you've been, all of us been addicted to, listen, drugs ain't the only thing you can, you can be addicted to Pepsi, TV, good times, crack, tablets, anything. But God restores us. And when he shines us up, you never knew what I used to be on. And some folks say, I thank God I don't look like what I've been through. God is good. Bless you, my brother. Riley Jackson, bless you. God bless you. 